Welcome to Zelda's Peaches and Biscuits podcast. I'm Elena Doten, the director of the Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald Museum, and I'm joined with... Uh, Maura Martello. I am a docent here at the uh, museum. I'm a Zelda researcher and a fan, a general fan. <laughs> so welcome. Uh, today we're going to talk about Oak Park. And for um, most people know Oak Park plays very prominently in Zelda's life, both as a child and then um, in terms of Scott and Zelda's time here in Montgomery, there were a lot of dances. Yeah. Yeah, they had a, a really beautiful pavilion, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, where a lot of, I guess it must have been some kind of rental space. Um, and apparent, we're, I'm not sure, I wasn't able to find out when the pavilion came down. Uh, Do you think it might have been in the 50s? I think it might have been in, there was a, the, so let's talk about the history of the park first. Um, apparently, you, like I grew up here, I went to Oak Park a lot as a kid. They take you there on, you know, your school um, trips. trips and the planetarium's there. So yeah. you go to the planetarium, you have a picnic in it. Um, it's when, uh, Gail's. Gales Planetarium, named th- after uh, the former mayor. I'd Am say, I wrong? Th- you're probably right. That's what you realize is that you you've been here, you know it, but then you, you realize exactly. how much how much history you don't you actually. Don't know, you don't need to know it. Yeah. Well, and you realize there's names on everything, and you have no idea who half these people are. Yes. And I think it's named after Tacky Gale, who was the mayor of Montgomery, uh, and it's called Gales uh, Planetarium. Yeah. yeah. Uh, So Oak Park figures very prominently in Montgomery history because, like most things Montgomery, you have the early years, you have the... The interstate years. Yeah, well, you you have the Scott Zelda years, then later, you know, you you, you have all the the history of Alabama. It becomes a major point um, in the civil rights movement because when the parks are desegregated, instead of desegregated, they shut it down. So there's these years that it was closed, and then when I was a child, I, we didn't know any of this, you know, in the 70s, 80s, uh, late, well, really the 80s. Um, so, you know, you go on the school trip, you have picnics, um, and then you just went on weekends. So it, it has this very long history, and in and, and, and doing this podcast, I really realize as a Montgomery and you... I don't know, you kind of have more of a sense of hope, maybe, because you can see how things used to be, and then I guess from my age on, it's not like that. Do you know what I mean? So you, you could, there were these various things that happened, they, they're before, you know, they happened before your time. You've seen the progression. Yeah, and you, you've seen that things... You've, ta- you've listened to your family if you're a young person, and they've yeah. told you. I will say that some, as I have a neighbor down the street who's from um, California, and uh, he doesn't know the history of mm-hmm. Montgomery yeah. at all. And he kind of occasionally says things that make you think that nothing's ever changed here when, in fact, there's been a huge yeah, change. Yeah, and I think over there's a huge, and I, and I think that's why, you know, we're in the middle of a lot of unrest, but here you, you live. You know, you, you, you go to the Capitol and you're like, okay, that's where Jefferson Davis was inaugurated. And at the foot of the same building, there was Martin Luther King's yeah. church. And then you have the fountain. You, of course, you have all the black, you have a, we have a Black Lives Matter mural painted around the Capitol, I mean, the uh, Court Square fountain, which is, of course, mm-hmm. Zelda, it's Rosa Parks. You got Hank Williams. So you, you see this whole heart arc of history. And when I was, we were going over the notes for Oak Park. Oak Park shows that massive arc as yes. well. So going back to the, the Fitzgerald, um, the Oak Park apparently was named Oak Park in 1899, so a year before Zelda is born. Uh, and it would have then been on the edge of town. And again, Montgomery, for those who come and visit, Montgomery, down you have the downtown, and the further you go east and outward, you can almost see the decades. Um, it's it, it almost appears from reading some of the material you sent me mm. uh, that Montgomery was once very very small. Yes, 
And it, Oak Park, which we would cons- I would consider, you can correct me if I'm wrong, almost downtown. Yeah, it's very near downtown. But uh, it would have been on the edge. But was considered forest land. Yeah. You know, it was sort of, you know, just well, out there. That's also Cloverdale. So we're, what, two miles from yeah. downtown? Yeah. I think we're two miles from the Equal Justice Memorial and where Zelda lived. But Cloverdale was its own small municipality. Yes. I mean, to this day, there's still, quote, the mayor of the old Cloverdale Association. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was considered its own town from Montgomery, and it's, what, two miles away. Right. It was called the Pines, and I yeah. have a postcard. You yeah. probably have it, too, of a trolley going through the Pines yeah. to Cloverdale. I mean, it just was totally rural. And so then... And now it's considered really part of the city. And you just see how... Like history repeats itself because then there is, do you want to be brought into the city or not? And in, as, as Montgomery moves further and further east, now it's Pike Road, Alabama. Mm-hmm. Will they be a part of it? And they're like, no, we don't want to. Yes, we do. <laughs> and there's that whole, so I, they're not. They have their own mayor as well. He's mm-hmm. on the radio. So you just kind of see the same, you know, history repeating, good and bad. <laughs> um so mostly good. I think I mostly say. good. I, I'm, I know it sounds strange, but going over this and you really see the arc of Oak Park, it, it gave me, you're like, no, things are actually better. <laughs> you know, yeah. you see the history. Um, so to give you an idea, what, we wanted, what we're trying to set up as we head towards Zelda's high school days and then uh, meeting Scott is to try to, um, because Oak Park figures so, I think, prominently. Yes. Uh, Because that's where, even though they meet at the country club, from what we were seeing, the pavilion at Oak Park was probably a much better venue than the actual country club. It sounds kind of, um, I I think most Fitzgerald fans know they met at a dance at the country club, but the country club wasn't what we think of country clubs now. It was a sports venue. It wasn't this upper class, wealthy was almost like <laughs> yeah the photographs you know they have moose's heads on the wall you yeah. know it's not it, it's well, nothing like the modern uh country club that we hear oh have no here because now we'll on also road well also i was just saying in terms of status country clubs now are these very private elite yeah. they have this closed membership i think and particularly from the 60s probably through the 80s or 90s um and that the building, the Montgomery Country Club, is still here in the neighborhood. It's a very beautiful venue. You have the formal dining room, the informal dining room. Um, whereas when you see the country club that they met at, it's a barn. <laughs> it really is. It re- well, I'll, you, look, go to our show page. It, it was across the street from where the modern day uh, country club is today. Yeah. Uh, but then it wasn't necessarily, and also you have debutante balls where, you know, you come out, they still do them, they're in the white dress, whatnot, and, you know, you're presented. Um, and that was two things. Um, about doing the research is Rosalind refused to come to go through with a debutante. So, you know, the again, the Sarah sisters were really on the edge, but two, you didn't, that part of the culture was not yet associated with a country club. Okay. Now we have no evidence that Zelda ever mm-hmm. was a debutante. No, but we know that Rosalind it's in the paper mm-hmm. that she refused. That's very cool. And, um, that, and because she was actually going to work, and then there's an even no, like you said, no mention. So I think that 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 further, I don't know, I don't know if it confirms our theory the about Zelda, yeah, and the independence of the Sarah family, yeah. But it's also Zelda following kind of in Rosalind's steps. Yes. But but what I'm trying to say is that part of the Fitzgerald lore is this country club mindset because you have Gatsby, the wealth. That they were, but here in Montgomery, that country club idea wasn't here yet. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so where these, so the, the more elegant place that they're probably going to dance is probably the city auditorium and then the, the pavilion at Oak Park. So there is a story from 1902. Um, I could not actually date when they put the pavilion up, but one of the earliest descriptions of the interior of the pavilion, uh, and it's from this elk meeting. And um, 
So it, it clearly was a rental space. So mm-hmm. you're, you're seeing a lot of uh, civic groups meeting there, dances, um, as we'll see in a second, like traveling um, shows, theatricals. So it's clearly like a rental space. And it says the selection of the Oak Park Pavilion as the scene of the entertainment was most happy. The difference between the heated city and the open little building nestling in the trees swept by cooling breezes was marked. So it has this sense of downtown versus a little bit outside. And it says inside the pavilion was a small stage and chairs had been provided for the crowd to sit and enjoy the program. To the north of the building was the refreshment booth and had been established, which was uh, the basis of operation of the large corps of waiters. This I thought was interesting because you... I think we always think you got to go to the concession stand. Yeah. But here they have functioning waiters, mm. which I thought was kind of would be nice. <laughs> you know, you don't have to stand in line to get your, your whatever. Uh, and the it's, refresh. It's not my idea of what these uh, dances were like, to be honest. I yeah. Mean, your, your research yeah. has proven to me yeah. that m- my imagination about what they were like is very different. Yeah. And I, I think that's that we, we, I, I think I transferred my ideas of what it was like at the country club here on, um, on uh, Carter Hill road to yeah. Oak, Oak uh, park. Yeah. And I think as, as we find out that they're the way that they live their lives here was different because one technology was different. You know, you don't have heating and air conditioning. Um, and two, we'll see in a minute, um, you, they, they're still using, you have the early automobile, but you have the street cars, which made things a bit more mobile, mm-hmm. you know, that, that you think Zelda could just, they could take these street cars all over town, yeah. which gave you a certain independence at a younger age than, than children would have today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and so... Going ahead, the other was that we found this thing. It says Boer War Spectacle. And this, I think this is the opposite. So you're having these small groups, having these small dances or entertainments at the pavilion. But then they had this, and when they say spectacle, they're not kidding. It was, uh, if you don't know the, the Boer War, it was the, you know, the war between the British and, and, the South, and South Africa. And it says not only are the 300 boars with the Boar War Company, but they also had all these horses. So, I mean, I can't, it, it had it sounds, to be. It, it's, it sounds like a British ver- version of, uh, you know, the Wild West shows, yes. actually. And they had apparently a huge hot air balloon. 300 boars. Yes. It's, Bo- a boar is uh, a Dutchman. Yes, basically. a Dutchman, yeah. yeah. So we're, we're not saying they're boring. <laughs> like, can you imagine 300 boars? Like, oh, what a bore. Um, so no, it was, it was a war that was yeah. fought, I think, around uh, 1905. But basically, they turned it into this huge traveling spectacle. And, and it no doubt, they had these huge train shows. If you think like Barnum and Bailey Circus traveled by train, even up until the last 10 years, you know, they have these, so that's how they would, would travel. So they have the, So they're having small events, they're having massive just grandiose events, fireworks. Um, and then um, in, we'll jump real quick to 1908. It says Sunday in the parks. Now, there were two other major parks, uh, which when we get to the high school years, there's Electric Park, which if you're from the Montgomery area is the Forest Hills area, which would have been even further out of town. Mm-hmm. Um, going east. Going east, it would be out Atlanta Highway, Madison Avenue to Atlanta Highway. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was kind of known as a small Coney Island. It's often referred to as a Coney Island. So it had all these, you know, it was all lit up. It Mm -hmm. clearly is there at night and they're having big, um, fireworks displays. And then there's Pickett Springs, which is even further out, which is on the North side of town. And I thought, how are they getting to these places? And, um, in the early research for when Scott is here at Camp Sheridan, because, Camp Sheridan it was very near where Pickett Springs was. Yes, it might even be on the same uh, land. Sure. Yeah, it's that it's in it's not far where the Montgomery Zoo is today. It's on the north side of town, our northern boulevard, and uh, the neighborhood area is called Boylston. There are still um, 
some of the big guns from World War One, and then um, there were th- plaques. There's plaques, but there's some of the stuff because it was this huge amount of land out there. And I think there's one or two. There's a chapel that they say was originally there, mm-hmm. and then there's a small brick building which I think is a barber shop now, which is a, a part of the original. But with Pickett Springs, they have um, tram cars going out. They have the Pickett Springs line. So that's how they're getting to and from these um, parks, which you think there's um, – that in itself has a kind of festival-like quality, I think, riding out because you're riding with groups to and from these events. And I think in one of these articles it mentioned that they were um, preparing for the, the crowds – so you just think you're dressed up, you're all on the train Some, going together. Maybe in St. Louis. Yes. You know. And uh, they're traveling back and forth. And and that ride, the anticipation going out is always exciting. Then you have the big night and then you're like, Oh, I'm tired in the train coming yeah. back. So I was just thinking that's not something that you hear much about in, in Scott and Zelda's narrative is for someone who, for Scott, who wrote about the automobile, and in fact, I don't know if you, you saw our Facebook, um, the yellow Rolls Royce used in the Redford Gatsby is currently up for sale. Yes. And I, so I you see think that. that Fitzgerald really popularizes the automobile, but and you talk about how they're driving around Europe and all this, mm-hmm. but, but we don't really think about how they traveled when they met here, and it's very clearly on these tram lines going to and from these parties, um, Mayfield talks about some of um, um, the rival, the rival boys here, and how one of them had a bear cat, yeah. and that they they would drive Zelda around where Scott couldn't. But maybe it's my romance of tra- I love trains, but the idea of riding trams around with your friends, going to all these parks and parties, and yeah, I, it, obviously we have some photographs of Zelda. Uh, I'm not quite sure where they were taken with her school friends, and there's they're they're sitting near a car. Um, yeah, it's I've, a jalopy of sorts. I know that so we they did, they did occasionally have access to cars, but yeah, yeah the tram yeah. system. Since the bus system took over Montgomery. Yeah, uh, later on. Yeah, they replaced the. Uh, um, they pulled up a lot of the tracks. Yeah, you, you, um, Dexter Avenue is is wide because they ran up down the middle. Uh, we have replica trams, or I don't know if they're in service right now, but they're replicas, but There's they're, one they're like a bus. Yes. They drive them around, yes. yeah. Um, so next, the other thing I was thinking about is what did the park mean to Zelda as a young girl growing up? And uh, we found this very interesting article about Judge Sarah. It's in yeah. 1905, so she'd only been about five, five years, years old. old. Four or five, and it says Judge Sarah. The story is Judge Sarah and Lobo the Wolf at Oak Park are great friends. And when I was a child, there was still the remnant of, of the, the zoo. Qu- yeah, it was a zoo is very generous. Yeah. <laughs> they, they had, um, and we looked at, and there are some, and we'll post these. And it seems like what I remember as a child, there was this island. And it had a moat around it, and they had these poor monkeys mm. stranded. Yeah. On, it was, <laughs> I don't like zoos. I'll just put my dad's a veterinarian. <laughs> zoos are like, it reminds so me sad. of the uh, Central Park Zoo in New York City mm. in the 70s, which had this poor, gigantic um, polar bear. Oh, yeah. It's just the and worst. And if you know New York in summer, you know, finally he ate somebody. He ate a uh, drunk who, who climbed through the bars. <laughs> and that was the end of the, the zoo. Oh, <laughs> I think they brought it back since then. Yeah. But that poor polar bear. They had, yeah, they have this, the other sad, the one of the saddest to me is we were in New Orleans for the Sugar Bowl. Yeah. Um, and it's New Year's. It's, it was right above freezing. And we went to the Audubon Zoo. If anyone's ever been, it's like a rite of Southern Passage. At one point, one, if, what, I don't care what it, your team is, they're at the Sugar Bowl. <laughs> and it's New Orleans. And, you know, you go to the zoo, you go to the aquarium. And it was just, and we went because I'm a gator and they had the white alligator. We were, anyway, we all go. <laughs> we walk in. This poor Malaysian sun bear is freezing. Aww. And he just look, if you just look up Malaysian sun bear, and they have this really sad. <laughs> expression anyway 
So the Montgomery... Well, you know, the Oak uh, Park Judge Sayers the, wolf doesn't sound too happy no, either. No, it just, this was really sad. And you think a wolf being in captive. Um, so we'll post these. But but they did have this island, and, and they're always very basic. So they have these poor monkeys, which in, in what I think, 19-whatever, they were in cages. And then they always, in the south, have the alligator in the pool of water. Because gators just lay there. I mean... If any, Do they? no, yeah, I, mean, I was looking at <laughs> yeah, like, sure? they, yeah, because even as a child, um, and they live forever, mm-hmm. and they don't really need to move around a lot, particularly if you feed them. The enclosure that they have, the Montgomery Zoo is much better today. They have better enclosures, and they actually have this alligator um, where they can swim around and stuff. And then they have like a glass wall, and I was there about a year or so ago. And they had fed them. Um, and so, you know, when they feed them, it's not a frenzy, but they're very active. Otherwise, they just kind of just lay there. Mm-hmm. And so we were on the glass thing, and they kept swimming up to the glass like they were going to eat us. <laughs> That's funny. I don't like it. So, so here you see this poor alligator laying in the water. Um, and then they have, like, Canadian geese. So it's a very basic and you know but anyway so so judge sayre apparently befriends lobo the the poor wolf uh at uh, oak park in 1905 he and a friend of his captain whiting uh visit visit apparently they walk from their home or work walk from work to take a, a leisurely stroll perhaps after dinner and uh the judge actually ends up feeding uh the wolf I wonder if Zelda ever went on the walks with him. It's yeah, possible. that's what I found because we were talking about. Well, was he? Did he go straight to bed? So here is 1905. He's clearly taking evening strolls. So mm-hmm. um, his little girl might have went with him. Yeah, you know, I'm sure she would have been. You know, Zelda was. Uh, the more I read about Zelda, and I've been reading about her for you know 40 years now. Uh, you know, she liked animals. She liked animals. Yeah. She always had dogs or cats. She wanted a parrot at one point. So it's entirely possible that she would go to the uh, the, the zoo. This little in Oak park. Yeah, this little zoo. Where the <laughs> I mean, we don't have any clues that they ever had um, pets, pets themselves. Yeah. We've never well, in a way, if you're just walking down to the park all the time. Because this seems like a very functional park. Like if he's walking down after supper, mm-hmm. you could walk down in the evening and, I guess, pet poor wolves. Because, okay, yeah, the judges- so wolves are not, wolves are distinguished in that they're not domestic. You cannot domesticate a wolf. They're, you cannot legally own them because you cannot domesticate them. So the fact they have these poor wolves in this enclosure, mm-hmm. and then they said they're petting him. And, and then they're, they're talking feeding about them yeah they're feeding well. them and they're and they which you're like mm. and then they were talking about the that Lobo was the husband of the treacherous Blanca the gray she wolf and you're like Blanca had some sense <laughs> <laughs> um, well it gives me a sense that maybe Zelda picked up her physical courage and she's yes, famous for her yeah. physical courage perhaps from her father yeah I, and also these kind of I don't know I just how how and then but this was apparently a very famous wolf. So it says Lobo the wolf made famous by Ernest Seton Thompson in his popular book of animal life. Animals I have met is in Montgomery. In fact, Lobo the wolf is the property of the city of Montgomery. For Lobo the wolf is confined in the animal cage at Oak Park. Um, Poor Lobo. Uh, yes. Um, but it's it, it, I just found this very because we haven't. Most of the time when you search for Judge Sarah, you're just overwhelmed by the court cases, summaries. And this was nice to find that we have finally a glimpse into um, his kind of domestic life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But it says that he, uh, the judge and the bailiff of the city cautiously approached the cage of the wolf. Uh, the cage, the wolf showed teeth an inch long, and the judge and the bailiff retired. <laughs> Another approach was made, and this time the shaggy beast turned his side to the cage. The judge and the bailiff rubbed his sides and back. The animal appreciated it and barked cordially. If you know about wolves... Do they bark? I thought one, they... they do not bark, and they don't show the signs of... Um, 
they're not like dogs. Like mm. if a wolf is staring you down, it's not a good thing. <laughs> I, I I have a, a a family friend who uh, rescues wolves, and um, yeah, he, he no, he don't. There's no plan with wolves. <laughs> don't they howl? They howl. Yes, they do. Yeah. Yeah. Now they can, they do know their owner if they get them young and whatnot, but I just think having a wolf in public like this is actually kind of dangerous and it's really sad for the, sorry, sad for the wolf. But I do think it's very, it is very instructive that, um, you know, that they're taking these evening strolls and that, that this would have been a good part of her, uh, you know, her, her young life is, Mm -hmm. is seeing animals, but also that, you know, it's kind of a pet, it clearly is somehow a, petting zoo <laughs> <laughs> or judge sayer turns it into a yeah, petting well, zoo well no one's stopping them um in the same year I, and this uh in oak park now oak park was also a neighborhood like cloverdale is today and and it goes kind of back to the tram lines someone was complaining that the cars the the um the tram service um was not as good. It says, I w- it says, as a reader and admirer of your valuable paper, I would like for you to publish a few words from a citizen of Oak Park in regard to the bad streetcar service. I noticed in yesterday's uh, advertiser complaint from South Montgomery, and he goes on to talk about um, how, I guess, the, par- the, the trams were somewhat declining. But if you think in 1908, the trams would have been roughly 25, 30 years old. Um, and it, the other thing that was, I thought, because it also tells us how frequent these cars were, that you could get a car, and it says, now what is the result? After 10 years, we have two cars and a schedule of one car every 25 or 30 minutes, and they used to have one every 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. So if you think, again, for children, if you only have to wait 15 minutes and a car, a tram car comes by, takes you right downtown, takes you right back, that's pretty nice. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and here they're complaining that they're having to wait 20, 25 minutes um, for the for them to take them down well, there. That's, that's city people. <laughs> well, yeah, and and also, I mean, Ma- the, Manager Raglan's excuse: the South Montgomery is uh, is torn up streets and car tracks. Yeah. Now, what is this excuse for Oak Park? I'm reading here from yeah. the letter to the editor. So I think you're beginning to see the transitions. Also, you had rivalry tram car lines oh, here. Oh, is that right? Yeah, you had different. Sort of like the subway system in New York. Yeah. So you had different lines because, like, you have the Pickett Competing. Springs lines because basically they put that in for the entertainment traffic. Mm-hmm. Then you have all the different lines, like the one that came out here to Cloverdale. So you have all these different, and and I think it's Mayfield's biography that talks about um, – you know how the the tram would stop or wait for Judd Sayre to take him to work. Yes. So you have these different competing lines. Um, so and sometimes they they reoriented the lines based on where and travel, and then eventually Montgomery gives them up. You know, and institutes yeah. buses because, in a way, um, I wonder if the buses follow the same routes. That would be interesting. They probably did up until the 70s. Yeah. I know in either the 70s or the early 80s, the the bus system was reoriented. And now um, they don't use the big buses. They have the smaller, they have smaller, more niche lines now because mm-hmm. fewer people take the bus. So now you have these smaller lines that, uh, in fact, there's a bus stop. Most people don't know there's a bus stop right on the corner outside our museum, as people don't realize. And so a lot of times the buses now people call ahead and schedule. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I didn't know that. I yeah. have seen And the you bu- see the, the small, small buses. buses. Yes. Yeah. And I'm we'll a post a picture. One of our board members, Bill Ford, uh, is an artist. He's head of the, um, I'm just going to blank, not the Arts Council. Yeah. The art. Anyway, he did some really beautiful um, murals for our public library. But he also did, they wrapped the buses and... Um, he did one of uh, famous Montgomerians, and on the back of the the bus is, of course, Rosa Parks, but uh, Scott and Zelda. Oh, so we um, Scott, Zelda, and Rosa are clearly are, are currently on some of the uh, I'll routes. I'll have to take a look. Yeah, right? I'll I'll I post the picture. I, I see them. Uh, I see the buses a lot on Carter Hill Road or Vaughan yeah. Road. Yeah. Uh, 
We knew we know that at the end of her life, Zelda often used the buses. She yeah. must have climbed on with all her painting materials, I would imagine. Um, well, we noticed she walked a lot, yes. and then we have various accounts where she and and there's a few people still living that talk about her riding a bike. Mm-hmm. Um, and she must have seemed very. He uh, there's a gentleman that's older here in the neighborhood, and he describes her. He has some of her paintings, and he describes her. His mother was her classmate and friend, and that she they lived in Oak Park by across from Oak Park, and that she would ride her bicycle, and that um, he remembers her riding with the painting under her arm. Oh, is that right? Yeah, See, and he remembers her. He was. Um, the painting he has is as a, a red poppy, mm-hmm. and that he remembers her bringing it over to her mother, and that she would ride over, but she would have them under her arm on her bicycle. Oh. So See, that, no, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, well, I, that's, well, that's interesting. That's why you go and try to interview the, these rem, these few remaining people that remember, because he knew her as a obviously a child, and I would imagine he's near ninety now. I just always imagined her getting on the bus. I could be wrong about that. She was probably a strong. I we think, know she was a strong. I think woman, she did so. all three. Yeah, yeah. I and and honestly, I think it would be based on weather. She would time have had of to year. Have had an easel as well. Yeah, and and some of the research I did is when they moved the church, the Holy Comforter got the bigger building. I think they were using the the, the original. They're they're having painting sessions there, which we know if she's living on Sarah Street was not that far. Mm-hmm. So she's um, having it there, and then a lot of people describe. Even my grandmother remembers her walking around painting, but she's almost carrying. I don't know if she had an easel or not. Yeah, they, no one ever mentions that, but um, that she would carry the painting around. But in her later years, she seems to paint a lot on paper. Yeah, almost well, a, a, a tissuey kind of paper. Yeah, it was know. like gouache on paper. That's what some of the latter ones that we have. In fact, the rhododendrons that we have, um, it was given to Margaret Booth, and then we we have the provenance, and then it goes from Margaret Booth to um, her nephew, who is Lawton Campbell, Scott's classmate at Princeton. And they think it was one of the last. Of, um, of, it was painted right before her death. She gave it to Margaret Booth before she goes to Asheville the last time. Yeah. So, um, and it's a gouache on paper. Mm-hmm. It's a very well. I'll post it too. It's a it's an abstracted. It's green. It's a really I th- and but it's they're quite big. Yes. Yeah, they're like yes, three her, feet. Her, her or, flower paintings are quite large. Yeah. So they're they're large. Um, and that's in terms of painting. That's been my question. In the early days, she's painting on oils. Um, and submitting them to art shows or um, and she's signing those too so those I think when she still had greater art you know ambition of of showing or maybe selling or exhibiting and in the later years most people assume that she died poor but she didn't she died with stock she had money that's how she was able to go to Highland Hospital she had the rights from the last tycoon um, we know from the Biggs letters that she she died with stock. And um, so she's financially, in the final year, she was a bit better off. But she, for some reason, switched to paper. Mm. And I didn't. And I originally thought, well, she's switching to paper because maybe she doesn't want, she can't afford the oils. Cause quite expensive. Yeah. And you see in the letters back and forth, um, can you help her with, you know, when she's at Highland with Dr. Carroll and Scott's like, can you help her or... Mrs. There's o- a lot of discussion th- th- about, about paint, paint, and painting. sending the paints yeah. and all the stuff. And then, and, but then, um, if you've ever painted oil paint, it's you know it takes a long time to dry. It's part of it. You have the linseed oil. I know at my former college, um, you can no longer teach oil painting because the, the some of the linseed oil is considered toxic. Mm-hmm. It's high maintenance, so yeah. I just wonder why. We'll get, we'll do more research into that too. But I love uh, her watercolors. Yeah. I think they're they're charming. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are uh, are we going to discuss the script dances, or do we have? No, we we'll go? get to those later. We, we're not getting to her her and Scott's time. Okay. Um, the other thing, there were two other things that I wanted to mention is that 
So we know they are having this group dances at the pavilion. So there was two other stories. There's one from 1919. So she, because yesterday we're recording this on the 27th. Um, yesterday was, you know, the, the one of the suffer the suffrage. Um, the vote. N- well, it was the, the, the commemoration. Yeah, yeah, the commemoration was, was technically yesterday. So I did want to mention that they did have a, a suffragist came and spoke in 1919, and they describe, um, it says, Montgomery Labor have a great time on national holiday, parade followed by speaking in an all-day picnic, Miss White speaks, a suffragist. And so they have these... Um, huge parade and um and organized there at oak park and the pavilion so while zelda's in montgomery we don't see that much of her in terms of suffrage though and and we know also i was looking up in the 40s i was looking up the voting in the newspapers they have who you know people who are voting the voter rolls were in the paper and minnie's listed marjorie's listed and they're listed also with rosa parks but zelda was not listed in 1941 she would have been here yeah in the 40 some from 40 to 48 mm-hmm. you see um you know that's just like p- p- columns and you know you, it was easy yeah, to they sur- still do it today yeah and um, but i went through and you see zelda's mother voting her sister's voting um rosalind i think later but she wasn't here in the 40s mm-hmm. they were she and her husband i think were in atlanta pre-war but you see also see rosa parks is listed in the same roles i was trying to see if you had zelda and rosa on the same page but she didn't she didn't vote um that we know or she wasn't listed so we don't know what impact suffrage had but again, her fam- her sisters, like her mother says, my daughters don't need to be emancipated. They've emancipated themselves. Oh, and, did you- yeah, it's in the, it's in the uh, article where she's talking about her children and mm-hmm. uh, how proud of them um, she is. The well, last that explains a lot then. Yeah. The other is the other great lore of Zelda is with the Oak Park swimming pool. And the pool was put in, I think, in 1916. Mm -hmm. Um, There are permits. I don't think I printed this out. But the pool was put in around 1916 or so. And we know that it had the high dive. And that one of the things that people continually talk about was her fearlessness of going off the high dive. Not only was she a strong swimmer, but it's always this high dive, this high dive. And then we found there was a story. It says, death result of high dive. Uh, Samuel Northing breaks necks by jump. Um, and it's Head terrible. Embedded in, in ponds, ponds mud. mud. So, and I think every generation, and even still here in Montgomery, uh, there's Chimney Rock at um, Lake Jordan, or Lake Martin, rather. Uh, and people jump off Chimney Rock, and probably once every five, ten years, it goes awry. Someone's either severely injured or or dies from jumping off it. It's probably two, three stories it's up. Usually a boy. Yeah, it's all, yeah. and the, and it's always nor well. There, let's face it. There's drinking involved, but normally instead of just jumping off it feet first, they either dive, which I think it's deep there, but normally it's they're trying to do backflips or something off mm. it. But my my point in bringing this up is that. Um, this was set in Prattville, and this this young man dives in, and the water ends up being shallow, and of course breaks his neck. And this is do not dive head first. <laughs> in the south, we all know you jump in feet first. You never dive. You never if you can't see the bottom, you don't dive. But I th- wonder if this story, like every generation has it, if if this because this is nineteen ten or so, or a drowning story in yeah. my in my generation. Yeah. Uh, as a when I was in high school, a boy a boy drowned. Yeah, yeah. I remember when I was uh, when I was young, it was like the TV Miss Joni Erickson Tata, and you know it was a made for TV movie, and she dives in, mm-hmm. breaks her neck, and of course she's very famous for painting with her teeth and. And then um, 
We were talking about the uh, political commentator, what Charles Crow. I think he died a few years yes, ago. Yes, he did. Yeah. But it w- apparently was yeah. unrelated to yeah. his pra- paralysis. He was yeah. paralyzed from, I think, the uh, waist down. And he, his was, if I recall, um, a swimming pool. I, th- I thought it was like a beach, or I don't know. You might be right. But you, so I think every generation has this story, <laughs> which becomes, which they are rare, but they do happen. Yes. And that's what I wonder if that's part of the Zelda story and that high dive is just more proof of her, I guess, her bravery. Mm-hmm. Bravado. Is, yeah. Is that, is this the story, you know, is, is this story? Because, I mean, it's, it's a significant column. It's a major headline. Um, and they had, uh, and he was uh, buried at Oakwood Cemetery. And it seemed, and I mean, the name, like his parents are the Captain Nor- so Nor- Northington. So it seems like this was a kind of high profile case, yeah. case and death. And these things do linger. So I wonder if this is part of the lore of her and why. And so she's just breaking, you know, part yeah, of this. I, w- I could see that. Yeah. I could absolutely. I, you know, whether the family spoke about this, if Judge Sayre said be careful to, hit, you know, Tony Sayre. Um, or but also, but, you know, it, it's like with us, you know, like I said, we all saw the TV movie, and then your teacher's like, hey, don't dive in, and you're like, oh, don't be like, you know, and she's still fairly prominently known that it becomes the story of your generation. Mm-hmm. It's that yes. that tale. Yeah. and. And even at the lake, I was at the lake this summer. Like you never, you never dive in. And and most people, you 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 do the. There's one where you jump, like if you don't get your hair wet. There, it's a life saving. You jump in, and when you jump, you you jump with your feet out, and when you hit the water, you bring them in. Mm-hmm. So it keeps your head above water. It's a life saving technique. So you can jump in. So we had all gone to. We taken life saving. We all went to camp together and. Two friends, they still use that jump so they don't get their hair wet. Mm. <laughs> so, I always you know. imagine, I always see Zelda as, you know, arms outstretched in front of her and, ma- and doing an absolutely beautiful and perfect dive. Well, they also, um, Mayfield said, says that Zelda taught her to dive. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm wondering. Who taught Zelda to dive? Or did she just you can kind of figure it on your own? Mm-hmm. But, Could have been Rosalind, or yeah. But then also in France, they talk about how she's diving off those cliffs. Yeah, now that is really scary. That's frightening. Yeah, yeah. now she she was absolutely fearless with water. I mean, she, yeah. I, as I've said, I think she could, if you look at her body in those mm-hmm. photographs wearing uh, the bathing suit, I mean, she could have been an Olympic swimmer. She could have trained. Yeah. Uh, she's, she was a brilliant, brilliant swimmer. I think we'll do an episode on Annette Kellerman because Annette Kellerman, I think, is who she, again, patterns herself after because there's, um, and, and maybe if, if people want to look at it, it's, I think, on Google Books, a lot's on Google Books, but Annette Kellerman's How to Swim and she, again, is the first woman to have a million-dollar movie in budget. She's the first woman to appear nude. It's like, what, Daughter of the Sea or something. It's the first movie to um, make a million dollars. And she, like the uh, Castles, had kind of her how-to books. And, one, and, and, and they had full page here in Montgomery, like the entire page is her. And, she, and we know that Zelda had the Annette Kellerman, the infamous pink colored bathing suit was an Annette Kellerman yeah so I mean she's wearing a Annette Keller bathing suit I think there is a story I don't know if it's related to Oak Park uh, because there were many swimming holes and and where she stepped out of one of her bathing suits and uh, she had to be and then took her dive and then had to be hustled away by her friends this is a recurring theme in Zelda's life you can nudity is pretty recurring (laughs) Nudity and also being hustled away. <laughs> I think, though, I, in, in terms of that, um, the other major swimming place before Oak Park is the YMC or the YMCA pool. And that would have been an indoor. Well, we it, don't I know. think is outdoor. Okay. Mayfield says it was musty, the musty chlorinated pool. And we, I, there is a, I have a postcard of the YMCA. Uh, it looks like a very Victorian. You know, it was, it was a house that clearly, and we think it may have been on South Perry Street somewhere. We went and looked. There's three, what we called three little painted ladies near, um, across from, 
First Baptist Church. But I don't think those are it. I think one of the YMCA's has been converted into the um, Motor Vehicles Bureau. I know I've done an analysis of the... Is that, is that the, on South Perry? Uh, it might be. That um, building was the YWCO, which was... I went there as a child. Um, it's, it's just south of... When you come down South Perry, it's a one-way street. It's immediately before First Baptist Church, which is a beautiful dome. It's, you yeah, know, it's a beautiful famous, church. Yeah. Um, and when I, um, they had a day camp that I went to in the summer and they have an Olympic size pool, uh, indoor or did. And then for a while in the last, like the early two thousands, the police became a police building. Mm -hmm. And now it's, um, when I was trying to find the YMCA before, you know, the COVID shut down, um, I'm wondering if that was actually the same because it, it, like again, us struggling with like where the street and we we know it was on South Perry, but we have no idea what the numbers were, and it was in that stretch. But I think that's where, and it's a big building. It has like a two story like office on one side, and the other side, uh, it's like a basement, but it's a full size Olympic pool because that's where I learned to swim. Well, mm -hmm. and um, it's now a private business, and I was really wondering. If the pool was, because it's a lovely pool. It was an indoor, I mean, indoor Olympic pool. You didn't get sunburned. still be there. Probably. I wonder if they used, but who knows. Who knows? Uh, uh, and then uh, when, when this was, uh, this is when Diana got married. Because uh, we were taking our 80, swim lessons. 82 or yeah. something. Yeah. So we were taking our swim lessons. And then we, they let us get out because the counselors wanted to watch Diana. So we watched the wedding on this TV in the art room. Um, and then there was there's a historic I don't know what it's called historic building and it's been fully refurbished, but at that time it was pretty derelict, and it was of a uh, great interest to like explore because it was right next door, mm -hmm. and it was kind of crumbling. And then across the street in the back of the Painted Ladies, there was I, and I tried to look, but it's it's been enclosed you can't see there was uh, a tombstone under the house mm. so we were converted we were convinced it was haunted <laughs> so and it probably is, was so and, and then is. we would go from there they would take us uh to oak park we mm -hmm. spent a lot of time the other thing and it said i don't know when they it must have been in the 60s when they reopened it that there was this 65 they reopened yeah it. Uh, um and then what happened uh you know, I have my notes here mm. of when it, when it was closed and when it was reopened. It's closed from like 56. Yeah, they filled in the pool. Yeah, they filled in the pool. But that's, I think, where the planetarium is now is mm. where the pool, I think, was. And then where the, where the wooden pavilion was in the 60s, this I didn't know because our question was, where did all the paver, the paving stones? You know, the streets used to be these blocks or paving stones. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I saw in 61 where they built the current, it's called the pavilion. I don't know what it's used for today, but it's the stone, the stone building. That That's what they, when they took up all the paving stones, they used it to make that pavilion, mm -hmm. which is still there today. Oak Park is not really used that much anymore. Yeah, uh, I have toured it, you yeah. know, um, because it is uh, associated with Zelda so yeah. strongly. Uh, it's it's tired. It's a little yeah. tired. And they've taken, when I went, um, like I was saying, they had this big concrete sculpture that was like these circles and half circles. And it looked like almost a two, not a two, well, two-story modern art hmm. sculpture. And you could climb all, and I was like, <laughs> we were climbing and falling off. This. You just, I think a lot of the things that I remember really from the 80s, early 80s is that there's just no way insurance would let you do it had this huge two-story <laughs> oh, yeah. fort and we used to jump off the top of it mm -hmm. you can't jump off a two-story fort and then <laughs> and then you know metal slides um and then i think in the early mid 80s they phased out the quote unquote it was just an island because they had monkey i remember vaguely had they still had the island and the monkeys or whatever and um, I don't know if, um, and then, you know, there would be, because it, it was like 
water around it. And then there was the odd alligator sunning itself. So Mm -hmm. that I was very surprised to see. Because if you'd ask me, I remember they had the island. I don't think they left them out all year. It was like summer and the fall. Because you would throw bread out to them. Mm -hmm. They were like, I'm assuming Reese's monkeys. They were small. And um, and there was like the odd gator, I think. And, you know, it was just whatever. I don't even know. I don't know if they filled that in. Let me go look. There is... there. it's a type of moat yeah. on, on one, one side of Oak Park. It's a little desolate, to be honest, when yeah. I've gone over there. And when I went over probably six months ago, there's almost no play equipment. Mm-mm. Like, we had all kind because there were mm. four distinct areas, and you would run across it, and it, it was a very vibrant park. It had, you know, there was swing sets and whatnot and then there were there were four and then you had the big concrete thing you could play on and there was a big fort and you would oh and then there was a picnic area i think that's still there it's it's covered yeah Yeah. there there still are picnic benches there uh usually empty or you'll just see uh, a man sitting alone sort of a workman maybe it Uh, seems very quiet the other the other thing um and I think this was through this my before it was closed and then after it was closed. Um, my grandparents always talk about oh they're Sunday driving. You know someone's driving really slow. And here in Montgomery, and that was I was wondering if Zelda, they may have done it because they didn't seem to have a car. But a lot of the houses in Montgomery have these huge picture windows. And even today in Cloverdale, you drive down the street and you can just see straight into people's houses. <laughs> I mean, seriously, we people people mention it, particularly in the evening. They stay in the Airbnb, and you're like, "Wow, you can see in all the houses." But on Sundays, and I don't, I've never heard of it. I'm sure it happened other places, but on Sundays, people would Sunday drive, meaning you would drive through neighborhoods and look in people's, you know. Sounds fun to me. Yeah, and Oak Park, because Oak Park makes that big circle Mm -hmm. that my grandparents, that you would Sunday drive through Oak Park, because it was also, back then, very, had a lot of, it was like a garden. Mm -hmm. So in the spring, people would drive through, see the azaleas, um, dogwoods. It was very beautiful. And I know, particularly in the Easter season, people were always still driving, because I would, you know... Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've been here two years now, and I still will get in my car mm. after doing a little yeah. shopping, and I will tour Montgomery because yeah. it is beautiful. Yeah, but if you'll notice, up until even even when you get, um, trying to think, before you get to that Easter, the Eastern Boulevard, that's the inside of Montgomery mm-hmm. that went up in the 80s, if you'll notice, most of the houses built up until the 60s, early 70s, all have picture windows. Mm-hmm. They all have this big window. This neighborhood has them. And that's because people genuinely drive around. And in my grandmother's neighborhood, they're the most decorating people. Like, <laughs> there's a street <laughs> that the entire block, they do a theme every year for Christmas, mm-hmm. and they decorate Easter. And it's like, you have the Easter egg trees. So I just wonder if um, that was part of Zelda's experience driving, you know, the Sunday driving, that that was a major thing here. Mm-hmm. Even up until, like I said, the 60s, my grandparents, they'd drive and, well, we, and probably people still Marjorie decorate. Marjorie might have had her sister Marjorie, yeah. who lived next door to them in the 40s, uh, may very well have had a car. Yeah. Uh, and but, they would have done Sunday driving. Why not? Well, I just don't know. I know it's still a thing kind of here that people really, some neighborhoods, like every house is decorated for every, there's a there's a house just a block up from the museum. And it's somewhat small. And there's an apartment it, too. It's an apartment. It's an apartment. Yeah. And they do every single, I mean, there's St. Patrick's Day, yeah. Mardi Gras, valentine and it's not just a thing oh no it's beautiful yeah and they do it and and some of the other and then now it's football season so you've got your teams out and then yeah major decorating area so that's part of but i think that's part of the original culture and i think that's part of the oak park as you would have sunday drove through oak park um so any other we haven't got to the script dances but i think we have an idea of of kind of the 
again, kind of the childhood or the early years of of what her life was like, her social life, the geography of it. Um, and I think she would have gone with her father quite yeah. regularly to Oak Park. Why not? Yeah. You know? The idea of them feeding a wolf <laughs> its really intriguing. And petting a wolf. Petting wolves and, and the, the reluctant she-wolf or the treacherous she-wolf, Blanca. You can find that book, by the way, uh, Animals I, Wild Animals I Have Known. You can find it on eBay for as low as uh, $15. <laughs> oh, we'll, have to, we'll have to check I it out. I a picture of it. Oh, yes. Is that, I was going to ask, is that, was the author here? Or was that just the, the, the wolf was made famous? Here, I have it. The wolf was made famous by the book. It was one of uh, Judge Sayre's favorite books. It was, okay. it was published around 1898. So whether so he came to it early or late in life. Uh, obviously, uh, Judge Sarah uh, liked animals. So. Yeah. I think this gives us... Uh, this, the one thing about this that was very pleasant surprise is we got a little... Tiny a little l- glimpse. Yeah, insight into, into him and that he wasn't running off to bed that early. <laughs> or quite the dour, <laughs> the dour creature I make him out to be sometimes. Yeah. Well, uh, we hope you enjoyed this. Um, Again, we hope you are all well uh, between fires and hurricanes and everything else and COVID. Um, If you didn't see, we were in the New York Times a week or so ago uh, featuring our Airbnbs. So if you, we've had a lot of people within the South who wanted a safe uh, mini vacation come visit us. Um, and otherwise, we hope you're well, and we will talk to you next time. Bye.